So welcome everyone. For those of you who uh, don't know the World Shipping Council, we represent liner shipping, so container vessels and vehicle carriers internationally. Uh, our main focus, as you see there to my left, is sustainability, safety and security. Um, so in this session, uh, we will be talking about charting a course to green marine fuel <coughs> and the of Europe in this work. Shipping's energy transition relies on renewable fuels with near greenhouse gas, near zero greenhouse gas performance across their full life cycle, together with investments in vessels. The EU Green Deal calls for new production of green energy in Europe putting Europe in a very unique position at this point in time and in this transition. Now, to make this transition work, supply and demand must meet. And regulation will be key to making this meeting happen. Another key part in actually making the meeting happen is to get together and for all the parties to be able to understand each other and that demand and supply signals are clearly heard. And that's one of the things we want to be doing today. Uh, bringing together a representation, a mix of people and organizations across the sector. In the audience today, you're actually a very good mix. We've got about one third of you are on the operating side. Uh, about one third are on the fuel side or on the technology providing side. About 20% are policymakers, and then we have a good mix of shipbuilders, shippers, investors, and also the labor. And as you can see on our speaker's slide, we have also a very good representation. <coughs> and uh, I will, I'm happy to welcome Jim to introduce our speakers more in, in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for today's panel, uh, we expect to spend uh, the first part introducing a variety of perspectives, and, um, uh, and I'll introduce each of them in order, and they'll have a few minutes to begin. The second thing that we'll do is uh, go through a set of questions related to how the combination of policy and action by the industry creates the confident demand signal necessary to ensure that uh, production and supply come up to scale as soon as possible. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll finish by talking a little bit about how the EU uh, work that's going on will help lead us to uh, help meet, to meet uh, ambitious global goals uh, in the term measures that are set in London. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A, uh, depending on how the dialogue goes. Um, I want to begin with, uh, oops, Okay, they were there a second ago. <coughs> no problem. Um, I have some numbers that I was hoping, there we go. Um, do I have control of this, or do I need to ask you for it? Okay, very good. Um, the, um, um, it's usually better if I, I have limited control and lots of curiosity. But if you look at the online order book for container fleet, um, and you can look across the other fleets and you'll see to some degree a similar pattern over the last uh, year and a half to two years. Uh, currently, 51% of the liner fleet on order, of the TEU capacity of that liner fleet, is future capable, uh, designed for renewable fuels with dual fuel vessels. Um, and, um, and that's increased over the last 18 months dramatically. Um, if we think of that in terms of the amount of fuel that those ships all to be delivered by the end of 2027, uh, amount of fuel that they uh, will potentially be able to take up, it's about 15% of the container fleet fuel consumption annually that they would be capable of uh, converting to renewable fuels uh, depending on supply. And if we think of that in a global fleet context, that, by the end of 2027, means that we would have the potential to convert, or begin converting, about 3.2% of the global shipping's annual fuel use. If that fuel were to move to uh, 
uh, very near zero life cycle performance fuels, what would that mean in terms of GHGs that could potentially be reduced or converted into the transmission that we're all committed to? It's going to be more than 200 million tons of GHGs per year. Um, and now if I need your help, we can switch back to the other slides, but I'll, there we go, great. So this is what we're going to do today. Let me begin um, by uh, introducing our panelists. I'm going to introduce them one by one, and I give them each uh, a few minutes, three or four minutes, to, um, to help uh, put an anchor into the, the dialogue from which uh, we'll, uh, we'll launch into a, a broader discussion. Um, let me begin with, um, uh, let's see, I guess I'll do it in, you guys are sitting <laughs> That's great. So let me begin, um, I'm not going to use the order if that's all right. Let me begin with Matthias Olofsson. Um, Matthias Olofsson is the Chief EU Representative for the Methanol Institute, which is a, a global trade organization. Prior to joining the Methanol Institute in 2020, he worked to expand markets and applications for increasing renewable e-methanol production. And the Methanol Institute promotes the emergence of methanol as one of uh, the global marine fuels uh, and for road transportation. And, um, and Matthias, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think for my contribution in, in the event today, I think uh, what I want to highlight is, is the fact that our industry in methanol has been fundamentally focused on chemicals for, well, about 100 years. So we're now transitioning, transitioning very rapidly into, into a, a completely different value chain, um, which is maritime transport. And, uh, and that perhaps is illustrated by the nature of the events that I've been doing for the past two or three years. I've been only focused on maritime, whereas before it was on formaldehyde and acetic acid. So here we are. And I think what we've, what we've done is that we've put through the very competent work of the European Commission and European policymakers. We've seen demand signals in the industry and the, and the sector has reacted. The sector, the sector has, has adapted its business models to deliver these volumes to maritime transport to a much greater extent than before. And how do we proceed from there? Now we have demand signals. Um, how do we proceed from here? And my points were going to be, one, I think we need to make fuel production, sustainable fuel production and delivery easier. And secondly, I think we need to, uh, we need to, we need to uh, increase supply side support for the integration of these fuels. Perhaps also to safeguard the competitiveness of EU production of sustainable fuels or renewable fuels of non-biological origin and advanced biofuels. I'm not sure if everyone in the room is in the EU lingo, but uh, here we are. And, uh, and I think uh, those two elements are something we should look at in the next two or three years collectively to support this development. Uh, I don't need to take more time, I think, to. Thank you, Matthias. Um, next, uh, uh, an introduction for uh, Rasmus Philipson. He's a senior advisor in Europe for Maersk. Um, and as many of you will know, last week, the company welcomed the world's first methanol-enabled container ship. And while that ship is, is uh, small, uh, in the smaller end of our members' uh, vessel sizes, its importance and impact transcends its physical dimensions. Uh, that vessel marks the beginning of Maersk's transformation and the industry's transformation um, so that, uh, uh, that previously had had really no uh, green fueled vessels uh, ordered three years ago. So, uh, Rasmus, how would yes. you like to begin? <laughs> but thank you so much, Tim, and thank you everyone for, for being with us here today. Uh, I want to start uh, from the small vessel, which represents a, a big step, um, and start by acknowledging uh, and referencing the fact that you brought up in the slides at the start. That I'm uh, very happy to say that, uh, that while we received the first green methanol ready container vessel, it won't be the last, but there are many more in the order book. I think that's a very positive development and it reflects that it's uh, not only the ask, uh, <coughs> investing and taking the necessary steps in this regard, but that we're doing so with a range of partners across the industry. And many of you are here today in, in the room. So thank you very much for, for that partnership. Um, 
I want to uh, to make a point that I'm sure we'll uh, get back to that thanks to the investments that we're making today in, in the fleet uh, of the future, so to speak, in both in mask and in other carriers, and the most present problem that we face in the industry, in my view today, is uh, no longer how to develop new technologies that can propel the business of the future, but how do we scale the solutions that we have fast enough in a way that we can meet the targets that are set by the legislators, but also the expectations of the public, because they expect us to do something on climate change. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I want to introduce Carlo Rabushi. Uh, Carlo is leading a team in the Lloyd's Register Decarbonization Hub, and it, that hub is devoted to enabling decarbonization across shipping. Uh, with more than 15 years' experience in this area, he's conducted extensive research on energy demand uh, for shipping and how renewable fuels will help fulfill the demand during the transformation. Uh, now he's overseeing a, a green corridor cluster in Singapore, and he participates in the European Union's Renewable Low Carbon Fuel Alliance uh, and other initiatives aimed at promoting and unlocking decarbonization throughout the supply chain. Carl. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for being here. Um, I think we are talking about the demand signals here, and, uh, and maybe in this context, it might be good to take a step back and see where we start. If we look at 10 years ago, or even five years ago, um, you know, the discussion about decarbonization and alternative fuels wasn't there were, there were so many uh, signals, we would say. Uh, but now the landscape has completely changed. We have policy in place, we have a few standards that are going to come, um, we have a few video maritime, the I'm revised strategy. So you can see that actually this is part of a trend. And what we can expect is that these trends will only increase but, uh, over time. So this demand in signals will increase over time. Um, when it comes to shipping demand, uh, I think when we released a moment ago in, in, uh, in the report, and we were looking at what might be the demand of the shipping. And what we found is that the potential demand of the clean energy from shipping is actually considerable when compared to other sectors. And what this means, it means that the shipping industry has actually an opportunity to play a very important role in uh, unlocking and developing the infrastructure needed for the supply. And on the other side, we have a supplier that really need to think about shipping as a, a key opportunity for their development and their business. Um, but obviously, you know, we know that the energy demand in shipping is mainly driven by policy. And uh, I was mentioning before all the development that has been so far done in policy. And uh, I would say that if you ask me, this policy are uh, giving a very clear direction of where we need to go, and where is the final, what is the final point. So the direction is that it's not anymore a question about if we love it or not, it's more about how uh, we are going to uh, <coughs> take our brands. And then for me, one of the things that I think is needed and many organizations are already realizing is that we kind of need to move from uh, the current mindset of uh, a compliance in the short term to a different mindset where we look at, okay, how do I protect my business given that we know where we are going and how take a long term view and still remain competitive. Thank you, Carlo. And, uh, and now let me introduce Ricardo Batista. He's a policy officer working with the EU Commission with the DG Move, the transport part of the Commission. And he's part of the team working on fuel -y, so fuel -y maritime. In fact, if you've done any work over the last uh, three years uh, related to uh, renewable fuels, he's been in the room, probably. Um, the regulation that was formally signed just last week is soon to be published. And uh, Ricardo's background is a naval architect, marine engineer, and um, he now is really working in that engine room of uh, the ongoing transformation uh, of, uh, that will trigger maritime transport to help meet the EU Fit for 55 goals. Um, and today, uh, I'll let you get started. 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, I will use my three minutes wisely. And a quick note on a few of you, Maritime, uh, to say it was signed last week, soon to be published before the end of the month. The first uh, in the world uh, low greenhouse gas standard for maritime transport will drive greenhouse gas intensity of the energy used on board uh, down and will promote renewable uh, sustainable fuels in maritime. At the same time, we'll promote zero emission technologies and promote the business for onshore power supply by, by requiring demand and supply for onshore power imports. And the good news, of course, is with science. I am the one speaking here, but part of the team has been not only the Commission, but the co-legislators, all of you sitting in this panel, you, Jim, all of you contributed to Fuel You Maritime. In the audience, I see many friends and colleagues who contributed, uh, Dutch ship owners, TE, um, many others that are in the audience who, who have contributed significantly. And of course, last but not least, Exa, who was always a partner in our, uh, in our development and negotiations. Uh, so it's a collective effort. The good news it was signed. Good news it was published. The bad news is that it's only 25% of the success, the fact that it's published and it's, it's now uh, out there. Uh, other 25% uh, will be availability of renewable and low carbon fuels and zero emission technologies. Technology has to ramp up. There's, there needs to be business conditions, of course, but we need to be vigilant and we need to support uh, uh, this uptake in technology and fuels availability. Other 25%, of course, the implementation regulations that we are currently working on, they are the building blocks for the operational aspects of fuel EU. The regulation as it stands, without its um, operation blocks, will not be able to, to be effective. And finally, uh, the remaining 25%, the development in the international context. If the fuel EU is not enough to inspire and to promote the international development, which, of course, for maritime transport is the meaningful uh, development, the international regulation, uh, then the fuel you will, will not have reached its full uh, success. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, let's, uh, let's begin then this, this second phase to talk a little bit more about how the, uh, the, the combined uh, demand pull signals from uh, a clear life cycle based uh, fuel standard at the EU level, fuel EU, and uh, early action by fleets or first movers across the vessel types, how uh, that will help uh, really create the confident, necessary, <coughs> and timely. Uh, bringing a production and supply to scale. Carla, let me start with you. Um, what demand signal from EU renewable marine fuel production can we expect from fuel EU? What, what have you been learning in, in, uh, in your efforts? Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, okay, is a demand analysis, right? And uh, I hear more and more often that people refer to demand analysis as a crystal ball exercise. So, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, you know, no one here is, is uh, here to predict the future. We are not trying to do that. The, the useful things of looking at potential future is that we are looking what is there, what is the possibility, how we can explore and analyze this future so that this thinking will make us act now and that action now will influence the real future, right? It will, it will actually happen. So that's why I don't think like this could be crystal ball. But, uh, you know, one example that I can mention is uh, uh, be part of the Renewable Carbon Fuel Alliance. I had the honor to lead the work team that was looking at the demand at EU, at EU uh, considering the fuel in my time, but also considering also the, all, all the, I mean, what is the literature outside, what other studies are saying about the future of, uh, of, uh, of these fuels. And then what we found is that we didn't build any model, but this was a top down approach. But what we found is that fuel in my time uh, will drive a certain amount of uh, renewable carbon fuels. Um, so now, 
uh, when you like at least at aggregate level. And when you start to look at the breakdown, then it becomes a little bit more complex. And whether it is ammonia, or metal, or methane, um, I'm not even going uh, into the detail of this uh, discussion, but uh, um, I think we all know that uh, none of these fuels is perfect. They all come with pro and cons. And so, but what we think is that, um, you know, at least in the short term, and most fuels future is, is most likely to happen. Um, because people want to learn about these fuels, and you know, there will be many demonstration projects um, uh, anyway. So, the fuel EU maritime, just to conclude for me, uh, uh, during this work that we did in the Renewable Carbon Fuel Alliance, really um, was a uh, was very, uh, what highlight in this discussion is that actually it's some things that catalyze change. Now there could be some discussion about what fuel are eligible or not, but again, going back to the point that I was making before, we know the direction, we know what, what is the final goal, so fuel you may doubt should be taking this context of where is the final, what is the change that this type of regulation is catalyzing? Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Carlos. Uh, Ricardo, uh, I'm bridging too quickly. Um, so, when we think about this demand signal for well to weight fuels on a performance basis, can you help us link that uh, uh, success that Carlos is uh, describing um, to help? How does that link with the other elements of the Green Deal? so that we really get uh, accelerated development of the renewable fuels that we need, at least here in Europe? It's a very good question, uh, because in fact the, the Fit for 55 is designed in order to create an ecosystem for these fuels to be rolled out, for renewable and carbon fuels to be rolled out in optimized business conditions. And so in this we penalize the use of fossil fuels, ETS, and we promote energy efficient use of these fuels because these fuels will be more expensive. So you, you want to have an energy efficient use of the fuels. ETS in place to, to, to put this important uh, element in, the, in place. But just the ETS and the price signal from the ETS is not enough. So you need to promote decarbonization and promote renewable low carbon fuels uptake. And you do that with fuel EU by uh, Installing a curve for reduction of greenhouse gas intensity of the energy use on board, a curve that promotes predictability. You know, you can do your medium to long term investment uh, because you look at the curve, you can predict to some extent what will be the required level of penetration of renewable and low carbon fuels in, in five year steps up to 2050. Uh, the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation will bring important elements of infrastructure for supply in the ports, and then the Renewable Energy Directive, the third revision, which has brought the rules to produce RFPOs and uh, uh, renewable electricity production and uh, the eligibility of, uh, of carbon, recycled carbon for production of these fuels. All in place, ecosystem to promote rolling out these fuels without a prescriptive approach, so in this sense, I fully agree with Carla. There will be a lot of initiative and risk taking from the operators in, in deciding where should I go, which molecules, which fuel should I invest in. But in fact, more important from the regulatory perspective, if we believe, is to create the ecosystem and to allow investment to, to take place in, in there. But, uh, and I finalize with, we need to be vigilant. Because just creating the conditions does not make us um, um, now not part of, of, of the process as well. We need to uh, assess, we need to, in the future reviews of the document, of the, the legal acts, we need to incorporate lessons learned. So I believe this is uh, the role of the combined effect of the FITRO 55 to promote these fields. Thank you. Um, Matthias, let's pick up there the, the idea that there uh, there's at least uh, a signal, a demand signal that we can conceive of, uh, as we've been discussing. Why don't you uh, please help us think about how supply is developing, renewable energy supply is developing overall, and help us characterize how that demand signal 
uh, for renewable energy products is uh, is effective or needs needs to become more clear. Yeah, I think if I if I maybe take uh, kind of examples from my industry that I represent is that we've seen with with these regulatory uh, development for fuel American and ETS that that there's a significant uh, growth in uh, in the renewable methanol segments and. Uh, and that's associated with with, uh, with increased demand for maritime due to these regulatory mechanisms. Uh, we've we've seen that right now there are 190 vessels uh, with methanol enabled propulsion in the order books, and uh, that, that translates into a, a, a significant near term demand in the segment. And at the same time, we we've analyzed and looked into upcoming capacity in renewable methanol and seen that. In only 2027, we're expecting about 8 million tons of renewable methanol to be delivered to market. Uh, that's quite a significant uh, development considering the fact that only uh, a year ago that number was around 200,000. Uh, looking slightly forward, in 2030, Lloyd's Register has, uh, has put to a fourth of analysis estimating 1,200 vessels to be running on well, methanol enabled propulsion. In 2030, and if we assume all of those vessels are actually going to run on the methanol, that translates into a demand of about 48 million tons of methanol. And, uh, and our industry today produces about 100 million tons. So uh, it's a significant undertaking in transforming the sector to, to really, really address this, uh, this demand. And it, it stems from the regulatory developments. Um, and, and even further, if we look to 2050, if I continue my, my uh, projections, then uh, we did an analysis with uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency looking at how renewable methanol capacity will grow, and they expect conventional methanol capacity to stay at around 100 million tons. And 2050, the share of renewable methanol, when I say renewable methanol, we mean e-methanol and bi-methanol, to be about 400 million tons. Uh, so almost all of the growth in the methanol segment in the next decades is attributed to renewable forms of methanol. And the initial steps in this undertaking can be derived from the significant policy developments at the EU level. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me then uh, anchor this one with, with Rasmus. Um, thinking about how we maybe have made a start, maybe even uh, a, a good start. It's only a start. Um, what what's, what do fleets? How can fleets help expand this uh, green energy demand base? And and uh, what's the what's the role of, of fleets here? So uh, I think there are a lot of things that uh, that we can do as a, a shipping company. So very fortunately, uh, because it would be a shame if we could only sit on our hands. Um, we can order new vessels that run on the green fuels that sends a very clear signal to fuel producers that there will be demand. And I think fuel you maritime uh, is a particularly important piece of legislation in that regard because it makes it very clear to fuel producers that there will be a lot of demand for the fuels that they produce and that there's no way we can run away from that fact. Uh, thank you. So those are two, uh, two things we can do. Then, of course, uh, we've always been in an industry where uh, fuel is something we buy as a commodity uh, on sort of a day-to-day -day basis, if you will. Uh, and that might change. Uh, we are entering into offtake agreements with fuel producers to provide them with the certainty they need to get started on fuels, and which may also delivers us some certainty in the sense that we know that we will have fuel available. That might be necessary for some time, uh, and that's not a bad thing per se. It's simply a change in the in the facts uh, that are on the table. Yeah. So those are important things to look at. And then, of course, when the regulation is designed in the in the right way, uh, then we have an incentive to use even more uh, of the green energy that we need for the green marine fuels. Um, and uh, that would be, for example, via this cooling mechanism where you have state of the art vessels coming out of the sea using the green fuels and sending a signal to producers that there will be lots of demand for fuel. In mask alone, we expect that we will need 5 million tons of green fuels, whether those are ammonia or methanol or some other sort. By 2030. Yeah, I think what Rasmus has just mentioned on the offtake agreements is quite important. So we're moving from uh, the, the different reality to the f future where spot bunkering is no longer going to be the, 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 the predominant uh, way of finding fuel. 
fuel supply contracts need to be drafted and a relation between operators and fuel suppliers needs to be very much supported by these uh, uh, fuel supply contracts because um, first the fuel you monitor will allow for uh, a phased in approach. We're talking about 2 6% uh, and up to uh, the first 15 years will allow to try out a lot of these uh, formulations for uh, supply contracts, fuel availability, reassurances and we, we believe that the fuel new maritime will allow this transition from this spot pumping context to a more uh, predictable fuel, fuel supply contract based uh, approach in a, in a fixed in uh, way. And we believe that this is a, uh, a transition that is needed, not only for the operators to get reassurance on availability of the fuels, but very much so for the fuel suppliers to get reassurance on their investment. So we believe that, uh, again, the regulations are only creating the framework, but we believe this type of approach is, is really what we would definitely see as a future. Other yeah, I just wanted to add uh, a quick comment on this because, uh, uh, you know, bringing the context of the first movement initiative, right? And the offtake agreement is uh, very important with this uh, type of initiative. Uh, where what we see that is also quite what we see that is also quite important is uh, in this sort of uh, first mover coalition is the uh, public private partnership. But sometimes off the agreement between uh, uh, you know supply and demand obviously helps as we were discussing. But if we find um, a coalition that especially represent the, the entire supply chain and as well as the public sector we can even uh, um, foster even more the unlocking of this investment. Other comments? So well, maybe what I'd like to do is to think just a little bit deeper, um, maybe a little bit more generically. One of the things we know is that if you're going to synthesize any of these RFNBOs or the qualifying uh, advanced biofuels, if you're going to synthesize those, that can be done in sort of a producer context. But in order to have those be truly green, we need green energy at, from the start. And the transition of the member states to, uh, to achieve their green energy goals, uh, let me put it in the form of a question, is, is, is that something that can happen as quickly as we need it to so that as the fuel EU performance requirements come online, we will have green energy that's 70%, 80% renewable in order to produce these, these uh, RFNBOs that, that really on a life cycle basis uh, meet the promise. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll start with Matthias and see if Ricardo, but I don't know if everybody will have something to say, but the idea that we, we can't just look to just moving to, to, to uh, the expensive synthesized fuels, they have to be green, which means uh, green energy from the start. Any comments there? Well, I did not come to the panel equipped with uh, analysis on renewable electricity integration across the member states, but I think I can add my, my perspective on what we can do, uh, especially pertaining to integration of sustainable fuels. And, and right now, two relevant elements that are in, in, this, in the EU discourse uh, mm -hmm. would be a uh, policy instrument like the Net Zero Industry Act, where currently there is no mention of sustainable fuels in the context of which investments in clean, fuel te in clean uh, technologies should take place across the member states to, to uh, uh, facilitate the energy transition, so to speak. That's something we can, we can do right now to, to support these objectives. Another thing is we have an initiative called the Hydrogen Bank, uh, which is essentially a subsidy program for uh, well, fuel production, uh, hydrogen production and also derivatives of hydrogen such as e-methanol. But the Commission only allocates 3 billion euros behind the mechanism, which may sound a lot, but it's actually very little. And, uh, and in, order to, in order to fully utilize these, uh, these initiatives that have already been formalized at the EU level, we need to, we need to allocate further funding to, to supply side mechanisms associated with the integration of maritime transport fuels. Very good. Both. Yeah, uh, do we, uh, how, how do we see the, the, the perspective for growth of uh, green energy? And let's focus then on renewable electricity production, if we, if we may. Um, of course, we, 
we can't go the prescriptive way and say this amount of uh, electricity, this amount of energy needs to be developed by this state. But we can we can certainly see the very positive role in the Fit for 55 regulatory development to promote that uptake. Well, one can say that red rules for renewable electricity production are too strict, or or the the the, the, the conditions for installation of new uh, renewable electricity power installed they become a bit difficult, but it's part of the it's part of the deal. If we want to become really green and sustainable, we can't just relocate the renewable electricity production from uh, other sectors or or, or or put a pressure on price. So we see that um, by some uh, uh, market uh, incentive indication that fuel you will bring the multiplier for the use of RFNBOs in the first years, uh, the possible sub-target for RFNBOs, which in, in, a, in a very successful discussion and debate we managed to introduce in a formulation that we believe is balanced, providing an important market signal, can be reviewed, can be assessed in the future, but we, we believe that the, the elements for indicating that the business conditions will be there are in the regulatory framework. We cannot do more. Maybe there is some support that can be given to first movers. Maybe there is some more that, that can be done. And we believe our dialogue has been finished. So we need to, to continue listening to the industry and see uh, how we can uh, how we can best support the, the, the deployment of uh, renewable electricity production. It is important to decouple, however, renewable electricity production from renewable fuel production. And we believe there is a possibility to, with this decoupling to seek geographies for electricity production which may not be necessarily those where you produce the fuels and creating links for uh, green hydrogen transport and, and so on. But again, this is a little bit more detailed, but uh, we believe that there are options to support the uptake in the production. But I think uh, when we look at renewable energy in general, uh, renewable electricity, in particular. The facts are actually uh, looking uh, pretty optimistic in, in my view. It's a very cheap way of generating power when we build new uh, installations or new power generation uh, facilities. We need to do that to produce the fuels that we will need, those that will need green electricity, and they will need green electricity. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there are issues. Everyone can read that in the press around permitting and can we build it fast enough? The Commission is looking at those kind of steps, and, and I think that's very positive. As I'm sure many will agree. Um, and I think fundamentally, where Europe has an important role to play is uh, when it comes to the offtake agreements. Of course, the electricity needs to be green, but what are the other requirements? Uh, and I think there, uh, Europe has a very important role to play in setting the standards for what's a green fuel and what is the because we need to know, you cannot make an offtake agreement for something you don't know what is, goes without saying. Um, and of course, that framework needs to be one that's used in Europe, naturally. But also it needs to be one we can use outside the EU preferably. But we have a robust framework that where we know with a high degree of certainty that the green fuel we pay for is green, of course. Um, and, that, and that that framework can be used outside the EU as well. Um, and there we still have uh, some work to do, I think. Uh, and there the EU has an important role in doing things that the IMO cannot do. Just good news to Rasmus is the green fuel is the red certified fuel. And red certified fuel will be all in Europe or international. <coughs> and indeed, you're right, we are working on creating the conditions that certification companies can do their job in the EU or anywhere around the globe, and it's not easy because there are few economic, uh, few operators, economic operators which are not currently in the audit schemes for the certification, but we are building the guidelines to, to ensure that. And, but you're, you're absolutely right, we need to, green fuel in Europe needs to be green fuel elsewhere as well. Uh, maybe I can just complement to what has already been said. I think a bit more this uh, comparison between what can be done at EU level and what is is, is done in, uh, at global level, and uh, I think uh, the, on, on the on the policy side, I think the you know the, hopefully there will be some sort of alignment, right? And uh, 
um, you know, a, a time mode around uh, global fuel standards that are being developed, and I do think that that could actually create the right drive for having uh, actually the demand for these green uh, green fuels. Um, on the supply side, I would say, you know, whatever fuel we choose, it's very clear that we need to scale the infrastructure of the supply. And, um, and Europe is always, uh, always a big center of demand. So now how the global supply of these clean fuels will uh, evolve, it might be a little bit different from what we are used to now. There would be, might be not that we have a, a fuel production hub serving many a demand centers, but we may have a many a production hubs serving many demand centers. What this means is that perhaps in Europe there is an opportunity to foster a little more the local production. Um, obviously, this comes with, uh, uh, with uh, other factors that play. Uh, obviously, there is uh, the competitiveness of these fuels so if they can be produced in a cheaper way elsewhere, um, um, and also the demand from uh, these fuels from other sectors as well. Uh, so, which brings a bit of the uh, this. Um, these things are like, well, if the shipping industry will not be the only buyer of one fuel, but will be one buyer of many, many, many fuels. So there could be competition or synergy, collaboration with other sector. And uh, to me, at least in the, in, the, in, the, in the short period, especially in Europe, there is more opportunity to create synergy and perhaps aggregate demand with other sectors so that in the state there is a, we have much, uh, a bigger chance to unlock mm -hmm. the investments in the supply side. And uh, uh, let me just add uh, that the, the regulations don't define for sure the rate of the green <coughs> energy in the regulations we've been talking about in those five or so green deal ones. But the national energy climate plans um, are periodic reports by member states that uh, declare their progress and their ambition <coughs> of where and how fast they can get to a uh, green power grid, green electricity. And uh, uh, I, uh, I have work to do in the next uh, three or four weeks to read, but I saw some news recently in the updates that, uh, that those national energy climate plans uh, suggested that uh, the, the rate of progress is a little bit greater than it was in the last round of reporting by member states. Um, what I think we, uh, in, in the context, is that I want to know how uh, our demand, combined with the producer's opportunity to synthesize, how that can help create a demand pool on the greening of the grid in Europe and elsewhere. Um, I think we've covered the questions that I had enough that we have about uh, 15 minutes. Um, uh, is there anything else you would like to say before we see what questions come up from the audience? Anything that went unsaid? Okay. Um, we have, I think, a couple of microphones uh, around and the only thing that I will try to do is to make sure that you're heard so that I don't have to repeat your question and that you please identify uh, yourself very briefly. And then the last thing is that I promised these guys I'd be a tough moderator, so if you begin to become another panelist, I'm going to cut you off and ask you to just get to a question. Um, Mark, why don't you begin? Up here. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Thank you, Mark Watts, uh, advisor to uh, CNG. Um, thank you to the panel for a, a very inspiring and informative uh, discussion. But my question actually is to, to Jim also, if you want to put it to the panel. I think the most insightful statistic was actually the one you put up. That 51% of the fleet are ready to decarbonize, and we should all applaud the 51%. <coughs> my concern is actually turning it the other way around, if I may to you and the panel. 49%, almost the majority of the fleet, investing in new vessels for the long-term future are not ready to decarbonize, be it methanol, LNG or whatever. What is the single uh, bit of advice you want to give ship investors, owners and operators to convince them to start investing 100% in renewable vessels? So what I'd like to do is to first amplify Mark's question because it's even more dramatic than that statistic and then to turn the actual question to the panel. 51% um, of the TEU capacity on order will be future capable. 
That's more than a third by vessel number. And it's, only, it's about 15% of the sector's fuel consumption. So your question um, is, uh, it relates to a question I heard three, two months ago was, you know, great progress, but why do you sound satisfied? Nobody in this room is satisfied with the progress we've made. Everybody in this room would suggest that, um, that with whatever good start we might have had or do have, we need to keep going, we need to finish, and until we're at 95%. Um, we shouldn't be satisfied. But what, the point of your question um, was, uh, was was how do we get um, to where it isn't just a, just a good start, right? Yeah, well, what is the message to uh, ship investors and owners? Because I knew a lot of them still, and a lot of them are still skeptical. They are committed to their waiting. So, what can we do to strengthen that demand pull among fleets? Should I, should I start? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> should start. <laughs> I, 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 I would like to de dramatize a bit. <laughs> so, and, and, and why? I think the question is really good. Uh, but if we look to the, the, the specificities and the nature of maritime transport, of course, we have ships sailing with a variety of uh, number of years of operation older ships, younger ships. And uh, we believe that. Um, decarbonization investment in new technologies and use of new fuels may be rather easier to design for newer new builds and, and, new, and, and ships which are operating for a less number of years, ships that have more flexibility to retrofit or to install new systems, but also ships that can pay back on the investment. So there's a number of ships operating where you you will be, unfortunately or fortunately, because the regulation will allow for it, to use flexibility measures, meaning to use pooling, to use um, uh, options which do not immediately go through specific technical decarbonization of the ship, but it will go through uh, application of flexibility measures, which the regulation will allow to. And you, you need to give this, this flexibility to operators. This is one point. The other point I believe is to uh, understand that um, whereas the numbers may give us a perspective on investment, uh, this is very important, but we need to see that from 2025, fuel EU enters into force, 2024 ETS, and the perspective will not be quite on initiative, it will be on compliance. So you need to comply. So in that sense, I believe the message is embedded in the regulations, and it's embedded in the framework that is also developing at international level is that the investment mares other operators actually when world shipping council associates and the companies that compose world shipping council have a number of fantastic examples on initiative and i believe that will give you competitive advantage because when we come to compliance and deeper decarbonization in 10 15 years then you will have competitive advantage and i believe and this is my note of Mark to try to de-dramatize a bit that I think that uh, we have the message to the remaining uh, um, percentage already embedded in, in the regulatory framework. Thanks. Can I? But thank you for the de-dramatization. I'll try to re-dramatize. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, you can wait uh, and sit and wait for. I think it will be very, very expensive to wait. Also in the near future, of course, there's fuel new maritime, there's ETS, there's a high low fuel standard coming as well, and some sort of other measures from IMO. We'll see what, what those mean more specifically. All of these things added up together in my book means that if you're buying something today that has a lifespan of 25 ish years, it might be very expensive during the last, let's say, 10 years. Is that a good investment? That's a decision for others to make. But I will ask that question, and I think it's a question that uh, that many people are looking to have a very good answer to before they make a decision. Okay, I see a question over on the wall this side, and then one in the back. So I'll take those two that I can see, and then we'll see where we are with time. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, I'm Bill Hennings from Rose Sector Advisory here in Brussels. I have a comment and a question. 
And Ricardo talked about the importance of energy efficiency as we move into the future. Um, and some of us took speed reduction to the IMO in 2012 and delegations like China and Saudi had tried to throw us out of the room. But the point is that as these expensive new fuels come on board, I think ship owners and ship operators will be looking very seriously at the, at the speeds that they need to operate. My question is about methanol. And the work that I've done on methanol uh, is visible that mixes with gasoline. Unfortunately, ships don't burn gasoline. They burn diesel. And only at very low proportions of diesel could you mix methanol with diesel. But methanol is infinitely miscible with water. And so I continue to wonder, having looked at this over the years, why the Methanol Institute insists that, yes, we need 99.9% .9 pure methanol for the chemical industry, but do we need such pure methanol for the shipping industry? The suggestion is that you could mix maybe 20% or more of water with methanol in shipping and it would work fine. And so my question is, uh, what is uh, the Methanol Institute's uh, response to that? Because I've not ever seen them write something about it. More particularly then, Mercer, are you looking at um, that possibility? And separately to that question, are you looking at blending grey and green methanol? Thank you, Bill. Why don't we take one of those and, and have you respond as you like to go for it, and we'll get one more question for sure from the floor before we finish. Yeah. Yeah, um, about this matter of, of blending methanol and water in energy applications, it's actually something that has been looked at uh, substantially uh, and and uh, um, we have their, their research project ongoing pertaining to to the matter and I think you're right in, in saying that there there is a, a real opportunity that, that this, this will be the case as we progress. That, uh, 99.9 BOE is, uh, is based on a standard that IMPC8 uh, sets forth, which is fundamentally for chemical applications. And uh, a, part of, uh, a part of setting marine fuel standards uh, with, with methanol involved is, 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 is looking at these particular elements. And uh, we're starting work with Inicio uh, on uh, greenhouse gas intensities of methanol. And part of Part of that research, which uh, is expected to take about two years, is to properly address this particular element. Uh, I hope that gives you uh, some insight. Yeah, I can try and very briefly respond. We're not in the market for green methanol, so we're not considering blending those two. Um, when it comes to whether we could blend with water or other things to improve the energy efficiency of the fuels used on board, then of course, because the price of the new fuels is much higher than the fuels that, uh, that we've used in the past, the fossil fuels, then of course uh, energy efficiency becomes even more important. Uh, and while we can reduce emissions with fuels, uh, and we love talking about fuel and new technology because it's exciting, but energy efficiency is critical if we're going to deliver on our climate ambitions. That's why you'll see that the new vessels that we're ordering, those look very different from the old ones, and that's for energy efficiency purposes. So the, the more expensive the fuel is, and it is more expensive, the more important energy efficiency becomes. And energy efficiency is critically important. Okay, so let me just say in transition, we're going to take one more question. I see four minutes on the clock, and I see lunch on my watch. I'm going to go with this one. Let's take this last question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, please. Thanks for the floor. I'm Wolf Wunderbar from Harvard Law in Hamburg, and thanks for sharing the fruitful discussion. You can really witness reading between the lines there is a definite appetite to, to go for cleaner fuels and propulsion systems. Uh, however, what, what we really have to face, uh, we, we just don't have ABCD available as we would like to have. There are some fuels with short availability, just name biofuel plants, to, to name a fuel for instance, and uh, just reflecting on the discussions at IMO and maybe C79 when the green corridors were discussed and some member nations had really a fierce, almost emotional opposition against this concept. It is a voluntary concept, it's not forced. So my question really to revive this fruitful idea 
how can we do that perhaps on an, at least the EU level, take a port pair, flushing shearness or whatever, to start to gain experience? Maybe that's a question for you, Ricardo. Sorry for putting you on the spot. I believe the question on the green corridor is pretty much alive, uh, and there are examples of uh, success with green corridors. It, it's one of the enablers for decarbonization, is that we, we, there, there are synergies put on the green corridors, cooperative synergies between companies and, and uh, authorities. And uh, things like fuel availability, simplified permitting processes, etc., can work on a green corridor level. And we believe it's a key essential point to continue discussing and formulating. I believe in Europe we have to some extent, with the motorways of the sea, we have a bit of the formulations that can help the Green Corridors uh, concept. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more at stake now. There's a lot more to, to, uh, to, for investment. And so we, we are definitely in favor of what uh, you both uh, just mentioned, that continue to discuss the Green Corridors at international level so that we're able to have really um, the models and the conditions for it uh, in, the, in the best way possible. We, we believe it's as important as the technical uh, conditions for compliance is that cooperation is also uh, promoted and uh, this is a good formula. And I, I know Carlo is leading some green corridor work. Let me just give you the one sentence so yep. that I can say Just so I wanted to add on this and say maybe link to the first question about well, how we convince the other that are more skeptical. But being involved in this type of the first movie initiative in corridor, it actually helped to build that trust that is needed. So okay, actually this fuel will be available because it's at the right um, protect environment where you can build these stars and uh, make sure that you kind of resolve this chicken egg situation. So uh, let, let me uh, wrap up by saying uh, these two things and then welcoming you to, to the lunch period. Um, we created a lens <laughs> with the panel, but the diversity of stakeholders in the room uh, are really needed. So we, we encourage you to continue um, discussing this with anybody in the room, uh, each of us in the room. Um, to help identify how demand for truly renewable fuels from really green energy can become more visible. That demand pull can become more visible so we get production to scale as quickly as possible to, uh, to fuel the vessels on order and to expand the demand across the fleet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming today.